is Steve. This is uh, actually the first presentation that I've ever done. So uh, thanks for struggling through it. Um, uh, let's probably just start out here. Uh, Mongo just, uh, I think like last week or a couple weeks ago, put together this nifty little EC2 quick start guide, which is uh, really fun to see, especially after you write a presentation about it. And you're like, hey, it's uh, partly done. <clears throat> Could have saved some time. Um, so pretty much, I was just planning on kind of a showing you, walking you through the process, answering questions. So if anybody, you know, wants to stop me at any time, feel free. Um, not a whole lot of graphics going on. Um, so first, I would just want to like start talking about the purpose of why you know you might want to throw Mongo on EC2. I mean it. It's extremely flexible. You can pretty much wire any sort of configuration that you want. You know, it's rental, so you can stop it, start it whenever you want. Oh, yeah. Is that better? Um, so flexible, you have full control over it. Uh, I can probably change this. Is that better? Cool. <laughs> Okay, um, so flexible, you have full control, you can do whatever you want, uh, cheap, there's no setup costs, uh, you run it as you go, uh, scalable, you can easily fire up, you know, this works great with Mongo, because Mongo, in my opinion, is like Honey Badger, doesn't care, does whatever uh, you tell it to do, it's not afraid. Um, some second thoughts. Uh, you may have is it takes a lot of time, especially as your configurations become more sophisticated. You may find yourself working more on just getting the database running than what you may want to be doing otherwise. Um, such as, you know, problems come up, you're going to have to fix it. There's nobody there. There's a lot of hosted solutions, so, and good ones at that. Um, someone may wire a router wrong in Virginia, and that, uh, if anybody's familiar with that event last year, brings a lot of uh, kind of problems that now you have to deal with. Um, and uh, you have to clean up after your mess, because uh, you know, if something goes wrong, you're going to have to stay up all night figuring out what went wrong, fixing it, so on and so forth. Uh, overall, I've had a great experience on it. I think, uh, you know, um, the last major time I used it for a project, uh, we saved probably 50% just on hosting. Um, and then you got to kind of like, you know, weigh out how much time you spend and how much, you know, money you're losing that way. But if you're dealing with large boxes, you know, you can definitely um, do that. We were doing a lot of changes in the database. So it was nice to have that flexibility of, you know, you can at any moment, you don't have to wait on anybody to, you know, take a support ticket, figure out what you want, do it, it's wrong, here's what you need to do. So it's just nice to have that. Um, so yeah, um, anyone have questions on why or why you may not want to do this? Uh, really well. Um, I've had kind of a mixed experience with it. Um, I would say overall, I mean, it's definitely the way that you want to go because it gives you kind of replication and kind of data security. Um, and I'm actually going to, later in this presentation, be getting up a replica set so you can see just how easy it is. Yes? Instead of what? 
Uh, I'm not too familiar with it. No SQL database service, sort of like their uh, um, no uh, MS SQL service and uh, SQS service. So. Yeah. Person. Oh, okay. I, I would actually say one reason is that if you use Mongo, you can run Mongo and things that are not Amazon if you decide to leave Amazon. Yep. Yeah. Less locked. Yeah. Key value. Oh, what's that? Isn't that a key value store? Yeah. No, Dynamo is uh, NoSQL. Um, their new service is just Right, but it, I don't think it's based on Mongo is more flexible in terms of indexing. Yeah, it's pretty flexible. I wouldn't be able to compare the two. Not familiar. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, I mean, uh, going back to how easy is it to get you know replica sets going? That's the, like takes time. So, is it okay if I erase this? So you got, you know, like a master, and then you've got an EBS block because you don't want it to store any information on the actual box because if it goes down, it's lost. And then you got secondary, secondary, each with boxes. These you're gonna want to do RAID, so you're gonna have multiple volumes making up these. And then if you want to shard, it just like doubles that and it just like escalates out quicker and quicker. So, you know, you may think like, oh, I'm just setting up, you know, three of these. Not a big time commitment, but as your, you know, database starts to grow and you start to work out, things start to become, take up more and more time very rapidly. Yeah. Is that a cross multiple instances? Yeah, so here's an instance, here's an instance, and here's one. Are you now going down the path and sharding everything else? Are yeah, you? so then you would have essentially one of these for one shard. And then you would have, you know, a second shard made up of exactly the same thing and Oh no, that's fine. Uh, personally, I haven't worked with sharding on EC2, uh, so I wouldn't be able to say from my personal experience. I'm sure that there is probably, somebody has probably done it and measured it, that you can probably get a good uh, picture of what you would expect. Um, the way I look at it is you never want to shard unless you absolutely have to. And, you know, uh, it just hasn't been the case, you know, in my experiences. Uh, it's a, I've run a Rails app that was probably the largest one. I was running on, I think, uh, not to get too specific, but I think it was running at something along the lines of uh, like 500 requests per second, per minute, per minute. And I was keeping up at full low, sub like 200 milliseconds response times. So that gives you any picture of. Okay, so planning, like how are you gonna do this? You know, uh, you always wanna keep what they say, this uh, kind of mythical working set in RAM. You gotta kind of figure out what that is because you know, you're bumping up from you know, one box to the next, sorry, by making your life a hassle. You know, that's a significant price jump. So obviously you don't wanna like underload it, but you don't wanna be wasteful at the same time. So you really gotta keep an eye like plan experimentation, see exactly what you need, um, so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> um, EBS blocks, I mean, those are pretty cheap, so you're, like space isn't really too big of an issue. And, you know, always keep in mind of that router problem. You want to be up and running across multiple zones, and it's, uh, you know, 
something really easy to set up. It's almost like a no-brainer. Why wouldn't you? And uh, you know, Mongo just makes that really simple for you. Um, so I mean, the first step to getting started um, is get set up with uh, the API tools. You know, you're gonna be setting, downloading them, setting up. You know, your system, your profile will probably have something that looks similar to this, where you're specifying where Java is, where everything is, your private key, so on and so forth, so that it can look at it. Um, and you're going to need to add a key pair. Um, so you can log into the box when you run it. Um, I don't think I need to spend too much time on this. It's pretty well documented. Um, one thing that you'll need to do, um, I believe if you go check out the docs, they go into a little bit more detail on kind of the security groups that you probably should be working with somewhere in here. Securing your deployment. I'd say take a look at that. There's uh, some pretty good advice in there, but for a demo presentation, I thought to kind of leave that out, but you're gonna have to open up 22 to get into it and uh, 27.017 for Mongo. And you should be able to run something like this. So it's uh, loading, and then you can see when it's ready by doing EC2 describe instance. Oh, yeah, sorry. Is that good? Um, and when this is ready, it's going to give you a uh, canonical name of where to find it. All right. So now you should be able to do. Let's update this. There it is, it's up and going. Um, so like I said, um, you don't wanna actually, even though, yeah. Yeah, it's just uh, pretty much standard. Yep, yep. Uh, make sure it's 64 bit. Like, if you accidentally make a mistake and then things start blowing up, you're like, ah, just wasted 20 minutes. Sorry, I'm not following. MongoDB, when a second replica comes up in MongoDB, how does it find that second replica? Uh, you set that up in the config of the primary. So as you're setting up the replica set, that's where you define where they are. Uh, just the canonical name. You can use IP, I believe, but we'll get to that. Yeah, so. Uh, you would just use the canonical name then, because that will always stay the same. Yeah. I think you okay to run in just one instance. I read Did something you? like that it is designed for multi-instance reliability, something like that. It is, and then that's for kind of making sure you don't lose your data. So if you only have one uh, instance running and it goes down, one, you know, you're going to have to boot it up before you can start using it. And especially if you have a large database, you know, you're dealing with errors, you're dealing with getting the indexes back in the RAM, it can 
cause some serious downtime. So the idea is make it so simple that why not just have that kind of security so that if one fails, you got another one. Um, I wouldn't imagine that there's too many situations where you would just want to run one um, because you can never count on one always being up. Um, they do do master-slave configurations, but I think they're trying to get away from that. That's kind of like a worst case scenario. Your primary goes down and you know at least you have your data. So it's kind of, you definitely can. Um, and like working in like development mode, that's pretty much what you do. Um, I wouldn't recommend. Yes, architecture wise, I was told that, you know, it's not designed for uh, in one instance. That, that's old. That's, that's 1.7. Yeah, they put. Uh, ever since journaling became a default, it's roughly as safe to run as a single instance of SQL Server or MySQL. Okay. So if there's journaling, the data is pretty durable. If you need that time, you do replica stuff. But you're not necessarily going to use data just by running a one instance. Okay, so that journaling comes by default, or I journaling is by default. I think in two. Yeah, two yeah, points on by default. Yeah. Okay. Then another question is that can you have replica set in two different? Uh, they yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's I work for Mongo with the and in, in a standard replica, and I'm not on the technical side, but, but a standard deployment we recommend for clients running in Amazon mm -hmm. is uh, you have maybe one primary in you know, one, availability, uh, one availability zone, and then uh, you have another secondary node in that availability zone, but also put your third node or your second node in a separate availability zone. So in case Amazon has an outage like they had last year with East though, You've got your web zone available, and you run Arbiter, which kind of does help you with the election process. Your data will still be available. So we recommend is a three-node replica set. Although some people will run a two-node replica set with Arbiter. Arbiter is uh, part of the it, it basically, yeah, it, it's basically a vote. So what happens is, is the three nodes have a communication protocol, so they are constantly talking to make sure they're up and available. Mm -hmm. And then if one of those nodes falls, falls apart, there's, there, there's a voting process that happens to elect a new primary node. So a secondary node can become a primary node with the motion or election process. And then That's all these are automatically. automatically, automatically, automatically. automatically. Yes. And the when the uh, failed node comes back on, it all gets synchronized. Yeah, you, you, it gets resynchronized, then you can select whether you want that set old, that failed node to become the primary again, or or uh, continue as a secondary node. So will the slave accept inserts, or does it only read The writes only go to the primary node. Reads, can, you, you have the option to elect reads that come from only the primary, or, is, or up to, I think, 12 secondary nodes. So you have the option, it's all user defined. So all writes go to the primary. Uh, by default, reads and writes go to the primary, but you can set the option to allow reads to come from the secondary. Sorry. Yeah, so uh, just to uh, kind of sum that up, um, your primary, I don't know why I said master, that's gonna run all the writes. And then from here, this is going to bounce those off. And what it does is it writes it to an op log so it knows where it is. If this were to go down, these two will elect you know, which one um, is in better shape to take it off. So if this one is not completely synced up based upon its op log to primary, this one will be elected, take writes, and then start talking now to this one as writes come on here. And one thing that you can do to help scale reads is allow reads off of it here. So even though all the writes have to go through the primary, you can still get some performance increase by running reads off of two instances. Does that make sense? So, and the reason why I wouldn't recommend a single instance is because if this one goes down, you pretty much have nothing. Where it's you know, not a big deal to, uh, you know, just have the safety that if something happens, you know, not only is your data okay, but, you know, the site's not going down or whatever you're using it for. So the, 
for lack of a term, the quorum negotiation happens, and then since you're bouncing through a Mongo S instance, usually locally on the server, that's communicating with the configuration management instances. That's how the clients know, hey, I'm now writing to node three rather than node one. Yeah, that's it's all in the configuration of the app. So it's gonna ask. And to put uh, my experience in the context, uh, obviously I'm gonna stop moving around so you don't have to. Uh, <laughs> uh, is from Rails development. So I've worked with uh, you know, Mongo Mapper and Mongoid. And um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on with, you know, you got those and then you got the Mongo Ruby gem and there's like a whole lot that can happen in between. And I'm still in love with Mongo, so I think that that's kind of a testament to kind of the database and uh, how well it's done. Did someone else have a question? Yeah. Backups? Yeah, there's like several ways to do it. Um, uh, the way I do it, I would prefer uh, replica sets. Um, it keeps it there. Um, you can go a step further on that uh, with journaling and do uh, snapshots on the EBS blocks um, to get a backup of you know, every instance. You can also, um, you know, if you want to, I believe um, 2.0 still supports master slave, right? Yeah, I think that's kind of. So it's a really slow lagging secondary node. So it might be 12 hours in the old, it might be 24 hours old. It will never have the option to be elected to a secondary node, but it's basically kind of a warm standby server that has not the most up-to-date data, but maybe 12 hour old data or whatever. So in case something happens, um, you can basically just run off of that database too. So we've seen that happen too. So what we call it like a lazy secondary node. So do you yeah. run this in a VPC or something, or do you run it in just open EC2? Uh, open EC2. And then, so some one of the machines goes down, how do you know what the new IP is when it comes back up? Uh, so if one of these goes down. Is that controlled by an application? Yeah, so. Uh, oh, I gotta clean this up. So when your application boots up, it's going to reach out and you're going to define, if you're running a setup like this in your configuration, you're saying look for um, ec2a.com, right? And it's looking for that if that goes down and crashes. If you have replica sets, you're going to wire in and you're going to say look at all three of these you know, it's gonna talk to them, it's gonna figure out the primary. Then if one goes down, it talks to them again and goes, well, this one's on the primary. And then, you know, by monitoring, you know, performance or the instances uh, uh, directly, you're gonna know if one's down and you need to do something. When it, when it comes up, if it can talk to the replica set, the replica set will know where it is. Yeah, but isn't that, and when your driver connects to the replica set, it'll, it'll tell the driver, and the all the current members. Not the it's the drivers usually in, yeah. The drivers handle failover and uh, all those secondary load balancing options. Unless yeah, you're running sharding. Except in EC2, it's arbitrary what IP and what DNS you get. And it's in the public cloud. So right, once it's, it's, a, once it's a member of the replica set and it knows, as long as all the members don't go down and change IPs at the same time, it's usually okay. Because it comes back up and says, here's my new IP. And then the driver next time it connects can see the current list of IPs it can talk to. Even if the primary goes oh, yeah. down. Okay, so uh, next step is, you know, 
having some storage to put it on. Um, RAID is uh, the recommended way to do it. And uh, so what we can do is run something like this, where it's essentially going to run the command, create volume, size, whatever, in whatever zone. And it's going to, so essentially all you would have to do, can you see that highlighting? No. Move that out. Right here. It's essentially just running this command four times and pumping the output to a file uh, for use in the next command. Complements of uh, this one liner complement of this doc. So if I kind of cat that, you can see what it's outputting out. And then what I'm going to do is catch those. So the instance we just fired up. So again, this is essentially the command, attach volume, and to that instance. Now we can take a peek at it, and uh, all of them should be mounted. Yes, they are. So let's hop back on. Um. So now I'm just going to assemble those in a RAID, and I'm installing uh, what you need to format for XFS, which uh, isn't typically on an image, and then just assemble them, format it, and then mount it. And, uh, this is going to add it to the F stab, which is pretty much just going to set some uh, some basic settings to kind of optimize it, um, and that's going to allow me to putting it in. That allows me to always be able to mount it in the same way. Um, so I'm going to have it go on data, and I'm just going to mount it there. If you take a look, there's MDO, the uh, rated uh, volume attached to data, and we've got two gigs. So we made four one gigs, which obviously comes down to two for final storage, yeah. Uh, for the first time I read, I think that was a couple days ago, that um, somewhere, uh, the, what's the best way to put this? It said it wasn't, uh, yeah. Yeah, from everything I've heard, it's been use it because it can help you out and it's not a pain to do. Um, but I have seen and have heard it working, you know, fine with, you know, others. So I think it just depends on what you need. Um, if there's any reason, if there's no reason not to do it, then 
I would say just do it. <clears throat> um, all right, so now I'm just going to, I'm going to download it and just throw it on the instance uh, manually. There are some ways to do it that uh, may be preferred, but it kind of goes over uh, exactly what it's doing. If I can pull it up. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's doing a uh, yum install uh, for some tools. And that gives you some stuff like uh, boot at runtime. So if you restart the instance, it's automatically going to come up. Um, some pretty cool stuff. Um, that's probably, uh, I would probably recommend going that way, but for the purpose of this tutorial, I'm just going to show you how to do it manually. So I'm just going to create some files. Download it. And you can just copy these straight into like that. So now if you do which my god. Um, so you can pretty much run it right now, and it's going to go. Uh, I'm going to set up some files, um, a data directory, uh, a temp directory just to store a log, and I'm going to make a configuration file. I'm going to throw that in. What this is, there's a ton of options, and obviously you're going to add more as you go along. This is just kind of like run of the mill. So where is the database path? Where is it writing to? Um, you're going to, where is the log? Are you going to append it? Are you going to have the HTTP interface? Um, and obviously fork it. Um, so this, all you need to do to run this is, waiting for connections. So this is up and ready to go. Um, with journaling, it will uh, pre-allocate some files. Um, when you're starting up, uh, you're talking about when you're out of the box, you're about to start writing to it, you pre-allocate it. Yeah, so um, what happens is it writes it in blocks, and then when it exceeds that amount, so as it's writing to it, it exceeds it, it will double it, and then that just happens as you write to it. Uh, 
I run on SQL Server. Okay. And what I notice is that the timestamp on those files don't change over time. The, they still keep the timestamp of create and maintain of the time that they were originally allocated. Is that true or not? Right. So it fills it with uh, zero so that yeah. writing is quicker. It, it pre allocates that. Yeah. And then the timestamp doesn't change, even though the date, actual date in the right. file changes, but the timestamp stays there. I'm not sure about that. Because it threw me away from sequence on, on the Microsoft platform. Yeah. On the Windows, I run that. And the timestamp don't change on those files. Talking about the DB files, the database files? Yeah, database files. But like it pre-located, it, let's say it pre-located a week ago, and it, even though it for a week ago it's writing right into the file, time uh, the file. So the timestamps on the phone. Right. They don't change. No, I don't see. So just to kind of uh, show this in action. Just gonna fire this up. How am I doing on time? Is everybody dying? Am I really boring? Should I hurry it up? Going? All right. Um, so I'm just going to create a new. Rails project. Um, so here, just adding. Mongoid, pretty much. Mongo, uh, something that it relies on. Um, just so it can talk to it. And Fair you bundle install. I've already installed them. So now you can just create a config. And um, this will go back to, I forget who was talking about, the uh, driver talking to what primary goes down. Here's pretty much where that magic happens. So you set the host.
So let's head in. We can create one. It's not showing in the fields. Cool. Well, that uh, kind of sucks. Sorry, guys. Uh, pretty much all it was doing was a clever way to show you that you can connect to it. Um, oh, you know what? Forgot to put the attributes. Um, does anyone really want me to show you that? Okay. Cool. Uh, moving on. All right, so running two or more boxes, or yeah, running two more boxes. So right now we have, essentially this, right? Got four ABSs on the instance running what we're going to do is we're going to add and for the sake of time we're just going to fire up a secondary in east and then in the west we're going to fire up a second one um so that's what i'm about to do so follow pretty much the same thing you're going to run another one. Not on its own. And you also have to repeat your security and your key pairs if you're going into another region. And um, I've already set that up, so now I'm just going to fire one off in the west. Just going to save this.
one now. The second one in the east should be ready. Pretty much run through essentially the same setup. And um, one thing that you have to do when you're setting up replica sets is actually run it as a replica set. So you can either set that in the, com the config file or you can just run it by going um, whatever you want to call it. So I'm going to call this one foo. I'm just going to output it to data temp ongoing.log. Oh, uh, not specifying.
Okay, so here it's pre-allocating the journal file, so we can hop on to the third one. Okay, so here this the second one is finished and it's saying it can't get the config, so it's ready to go. So let's shut down the one on the first one. Let's start that one up uh, in the replica set. It's up and going. That's up and going, and this one is about there. So what we can do is we can get the first one up and going as the primary.
All right, so first one's up. Second one's up. And the third one's ready. So now the uh, prompt changed to primary, letting you know that this is the first one. What you can do is you can just add these. If I go back to showing these, all you're going to do to add these to the set is just specify where they are. saying that it found it all right. So now what the second one is doing is it's recovering from the primary. So on the primary we said, hey, there's a secondary located here. What this one's going to do first is it's going to sync all the data from the primary and then come, on come online so that you can, if you set um, the ability to read from it, you'll be able to. All writes will still be going to the primary and you would just set it the same thing to the second secondary in the uh, different region. So if we so now it's finished, and you see the prompt has changed to secondary. So now as you write to the first one, they'll automatically sync with the second one. Sorry, I kind of struggled through that. Granted, first one. Uh, does anybody have questions? What? You have a lot of data. No, so we just ran it from no data. So right now it's just thinking uh, who they are and getting pretty much just like the getting to know you. Like I'm here, uh, what do I have to do? And setting up kind of where I am. Because you can have, you can set this up where this does have data and then it's going to have to pull that, all that data which can be slow. So one thing that you can do is you can automatic or you can have most of the data from a snapshot or whatever preloaded here and what we'll do is it'll just catch up the difference and then come alive come online does that make sense so it's right now for when it was saying recovering if it has no data it's going to try to get all the data and then be in sync with the primary and then it will know that it can come online and take uh, read commands if you set that. Yeah. Uh, that's all set in the op log, so it knows where it's at. And you go to, so, Let's say as it's receiving data, it's writing what it's done. So then you take a backup of this and you throw it on here. When this starts talking to the primary, it knows where in the op log to start pulling from. So if you have a lot of data, you kind of have to do that because your op log may not be long enough for it to spend the time getting the entire database. And then by the time it actually gets all the data, it's already stale and it's lost its point in the op log. OP, like operation. So right now those are talking and uh, that's pretty much all you would have to do is add in the, the host of the third one and then you would have three. So if one went down, then the two would elect which one of them would become the primary and would still accept rights. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me.